Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Liz Barry, um, and I want to say um, that you're all very welcome to the, the last but one session of the conference before Shirley's concluding remarks. Um, I'm really sorry that I haven't been able to attend the rest of this day, um, which has looked absolutely fantastic um, and very close to my concerns. Um, but I'm delighted to be here for this, this segment um, and to introduce to you uh, and to celebrate uh, the wonderful collection, Contemporary Narratives of Aging, Illness and Care, edited by, by the dream team of Katsura Sarko and Sarah Falkas, who are known, I'm sure, to many of you. Um, I'm very excited to be in fantastic company in having a chapter in this collection, uh, which I think is really timely and very important um, right now, as well as just being um, fantastic in itself. Um, and it chimes obviously very, very well with the themes of today's event. Um, and it's brilliant that I'm, I'm in their company in the book, but we've also got uh, most of the contributors here today, which is just fantastic. Um, so um, we will hear, um, I'm going to say a few words, and then we will hear from those contributors about their, um, their segment, uh, or sorry, their chapter of the book. Um, so you'll have a really, I think, a really good sense of, of what's in the collection. Um, and then we'll hear from the editors at the end um, and, and have chance to ask them a few questions about um, the collection and what kind of the, the thinking that lies behind it. Um, I think it's a collection that that responds explicitly, or it, it certainly does respond explicitly and thoughtfully and deeply um, to the COVID pandemic, you know, of course, that's a, a context for, for all our conversations at the moment, and, and particularly in this in the sort of areas that we've been thinking about today, um, and to sort of current concerns about, about ageing populations, about crises of social care that predate that event, um, and, and are only... Um, and those conversations have only sort of been intensified by the conditions that... that uh, COVID has produced. Um, I think the collection has really um, has expansive thinking about narrative in it, which which has allowed it um, to challenge dominant discourses um, about aging and care, uh, often very harmful discourses, um, and to look critically at the language of crisis um, that I'm I'm using. But we're we're also sort of thinking critically about. Uh, and the rhetoric of dependency. Um, and, and as you'll see, it does so across different cultural and geographical contexts and in an extraordinary, um, sort of through an extraordinary variety of media, um, which you will hear a bit more about, I'm sure, in a moment. So visual cultures of photography and film um, and, and book illustration, in fact, uh, culture of music, uh, literary works, and um, performance, I think, both formal performance and, and sort of performance in, in everyday life, um, ways of performing in, in sort of practices of care. Um, so, as I say, there'll be a short sort of precy and introduction to um, most of the chapters from, from many of the contributors here. I think the brief was, was four minutes, so um, give or take. So uh, they, they, are, they will be kind of short introductions um, to give you that sense of the contents. Um, and yeah, and there's a chance for you to ask questions at the end if you, are, uh, if you want to do so. Um, I, I won't, I'm not going to kind of give biographies of the speakers because I think um, there's, there's a lot of them um, and, and we'll sort of move through the chapters a bit more smoothly without that but I'll um but I'm sort of inviting them to kind of introduce themselves to you and um introduce their contribution um and I'm, the first thing um I will do then is to hand back to Shirley <laughs> uh to Shirley Jordan um to introduce her uh chapter which opens the volume um aging and care in the visual field the photography of Martine Frog. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, um, and I'm the reason we're a bit late um, and because I had a technical problem. So Katsura is looking after my, my presentation for me. Um, would you like to screen share? Mm -hmm. 
Brilliant, thank you. Lovely, that's it, that's my first slide. So my, my chapter is about ageing and care in the visual field, and it asks three questions, which are on the following slide, Katsura. And that is, what can photography tell us about ageing and our attitudes to it? What are the conditions necessary for breaking ageist paradigms in the visual field? And how can photography depict and promote an ethics of care? And it addresses these by examining the practice of one woman photographer, Martine Franck, whose intensive documenting of the lives of older people. You can press it again, we'll get a picture of Franck if you move on. Yep. Um, <laughs> Um, of, of documenting the lives of old, older people uh, was motivated by pressing questions such as, and if you bring up the question, um, why old age is disturbing and how people are differently affected by the fact of ageing. So this important body of work has been almost completely critically neglected in spite of its richness and in spite of the fact that to Franck it was the most meaningful and consistent of her ongoing photographic explorations. So I focus closely on the wide range of photographs in her first photo book on ageing uh, called Le Temps de Vieillir, The Time to Grow Old, A Travel Diary, the front piece of which you can see here. I analyse her practice in the light of arguments made by age studies pioneer Margaret Morgan Roth Gullett, who very wryly entitled Ending Ageism or How Not to Shoot Old People, you can, you can see here, um, which asks how photography might help to promote an anti-ageist gaze. And I also suggest that Franck sets up an implicit dialogue with Simone de Beauvoir's La Vieillesse, that's the third um, uh, book on the screen, notably regarding a shared critique of the lack of adequate social care in France in the mid to late 20th century. Um, and, uh, and similarly, uh, the two women set up condemnatory portrayals of state-run nursing homes. We heard a bit about, uh, about, about that from Chivon in her paper earlier on. I also examine Franck's practice through a lens of contemporary care theory. So really I'm looking at her achievements in bringing us to look differently at older people uh, and examining how she sought to establish an ethics of care through her, uh, her photography practice. And I'm going to spend the last two minutes of my presentation just looking at a single slide, which is just one complex photograph of care in action. I, I talk about it in the chapter, but in fact, every time I look at it, I feel there's more to say about it. This is made in 1980. It shows two women in their 80s, the Gravin sisters, with a young woman who visits their flat twice a day to provide care. I think it's a particularly challenging photograph in which the caregivers are represented along with the recipient and the burdens that fall upon them all are implied. It spares us little as it presents us with late life infirmity and vulnerability and valorizes the habitually invisible acts of care that are a daily part of life for many older people. This difficult image of dependency, I think, is one of the most intimate in Franck's book. It raises questions of what can and what should be photographed, yet without itself seeming intrusive. Both the subject matter and the composition powerfully raise the questions of how we're to look at Franck's images of care, what we might look for within them, and what she intends they'll prompt. The photograph for me occupies a really productively troublesome borderland. Am I asked to attend to an idea, that is an idea of care, documented through a specific act of caring, and a state, that is illness in late life, or following the language of portrait photography to focus on the inner self of the central subject? Is this in any sense a portrait? And I think that question is critical, because if I think it's not, then I'm conceding to view the central figure reductively as representative only of need. This moving, intense choreo choreography of interlocking bodies and gazes confirms that the self is always in the hands of others and gives value to the activity and train. But there's also insistence on the experience in the inner world of the central figure. So I'm kind of caught on the cusp between the immediate reaction to the photographer's document and an urgent call to feel my way more deeply into its experiential dimension and to ask the right questions of it and of myself. And I think this is you know, how we find ourselves looking at a lot of Franck's work. What are the right questions to ask about it? I think this photograph dignifies care. I think it transposes everyday gestures into an image of powerful symbolic value. It's consistent with suggestions of some ethical theorists that we bring to the fore of our considerations qualities such as gentleness, and here maybe we have an overlap with Julia's paper earlier, and that we take on board, as Sandra Lugier says we should, the routine physicality of care, care as practice, as well as as a moral feeling or disposition. Um, I think it emphasizes what binds us, the touch and the gaze. And uh, I also think that Franck is 
uh, manages that conjuring trick of being ever tactful, unthreatening, and quite discreet, even as she deals with difficult, uh, difficult material. And the final point is, I think that this photograph is in itself an act of care. Uh, and we've heard quite a bit uh, today about how creating narratives um, uh, or creating performances can be forms of care. And I would say that Frank's entire practice in her work with older people is, uh, is just that. And I will leave it, leave it there. Thank you so very much for that. That's, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's absolutely compelling work and, and yeah, fascinating kind of um, exploration of it, I think. Thank you so much. Um, so I am gonna move on to the second chapter in the book and to, uh, Bridie Moore from the University of Huddersfield, who has written a chapter called Improvisation and Vulnerability, Circuits of Care in Performances of Age and Aging. Um, and I think she's going to share some slides with us. Thank you very much, Bridie. OK, so my chapter examines uh, performance techniques that establish what I want to argue of as a circuit of care, which includes living with cognitive impairments, uh, people those living with cognitive impairments valued as equals in the circuit. It analyzes the 2013, sorry, 2012 performance of Rough by Split Britches, created by performer and stroke survivor Peggy Shaw, who you can see there on the left and in the center, uh, with her longtime collaborator and director Lois Weaver. And these are collectively known as Split Britches, Britches spelt like bitches, but with an R inserted. I describe how Ruff explicitly acknowledges frailty and how care is performed by the audience, by Weaver's performance interventions, and also by Shaw through her, her performance expertise and through her awareness raising concerning the identification and early treatment of stroke. The performance of Ruff is shown to establish a mutually supportive circuit of care between the performer, the audience and the dramaturg. And I'm just going to move on to this next, next, um, uh, let's go, current slide. No, still not working. <laughs> Excuse me. It was all going so well in the trial. There we go. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, in discussing such a circuit of care, one which eschews the binary of carer and cared for, I take into consideration Jonathan Thompson's discussion of the aesthetics of care and Daniel Engster's discussion of Martha Feynman's notion of vulnerability, which acknowledges the potential for vulnerability in all of our lives, across our lifespan as well. The chapter also explores other examples of theatre practice uh, and performance research with elders in care settings, including the improvisational work by relational clowns. I'm hoping to be able to then show you this slide. Yes, getting, getting the hang of it. Um, so relational clowns work in care settings um, with with elders and uh, use improvisation as a as a form of um, uh, of form of care finally I describe my use of improvisatory techniques with my father in his last year of living with Alzheimer's disease. And I show how a circuit of care existed for us both, not only in the improvisatory moments that we shared in his last months, but also rooted in our past experiences of care intergenerationally and anachronistically across our own lifetimes. The chapter, in keeping with the themes of the volume, specifically the representation and enactment of practices of care, argues that care developed through such theatre and improvisational practices is not unidirectional. And it draws on writers on care such as Eva Federkite, Nell Noddings and Joan Tronto to establish the presence of a circuit of care generated by a variety of professional and everyday performance practices. So I argue that such practices disrupt assumptions about the binary of the carer and the cared for, and that the interrelational nature of theatre and performance, particularly improvisatory theatre techniques, 
can establish a care that is mutually beneficial for all people working and living with dementia in its widest sense and and with other cognitive impairments such as stroke, as exemplified by um, Peggy Shaw and Lois Weaver. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks a lot. Short and sweet, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you so much. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, and I have a great deal of interest in this sort of sense of performance, you know, across kind of, you know, um, sort of living contexts and, and performance contexts. I think that, that is a very exciting um, thing to be doing. Thank you so much. Um, right. Um, so we are. Uh, really delighted um, and very grateful to welcome uh, Janet Gibson next, who is joining us from Australia, which is just really, really good of her. Um, and she is um, based at the University of Technology in Sydney, I think, um, and is going to talk to us about um, the bucket list and more, um, exploring care practices in an Australian residential aged care home through a narrow theatrical lens. Um, so, yeah. Lots oh, thank of you very much. Connections. Thank you. Great. I'll just leave it the uh, same way. Um, look, um, I am speaking to you from Sydney, Australia, the lands of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, whose lands were never ceded. It's 2 a.m. or past 2 a.m. I think it's 2.30 in the morning. Um, but I'm determined to be here to mark the launch of this important book, edited by the wonderful duo, uh, Sarah Falkas and Katsura Sako. And I want to just thank them both very much for inviting me to participate in this adventure and for taking such good care of me and my chapter throughout the process. The chapter is immeasurably better than when it started, thanks to your care. I'm also really grateful to be in this illustrious bunch of people. So in, um, in chapter three, I focus on two care practices, the bucket list and a fundraiser for the bucket list, the calendar projects. Um, now the bucket list involves residents drawing names out of a hat at intervals over time, usually every month, to determine which of them on that occasion gets to have a wish fulfilled before they die. Dreams accomplished have ranged from a trip to an expensive restaurant in a chauffeur-driven car to skydiving jumps. As many residents cannot afford to participate in the bucket list without financial help, the list is subsidised by other activities like the production of two calendars, with the residents following the example of numerous other Australian, and I note that Australian calendars, produced by organisations to make money, where usually young men or women who are often celebrities to some degree are photographed in the nude or partially clad. But I just want to focus today on the genesis of my chapter because I think it will open up some interesting um, things uh, that I focused on in the chapter. Uh, was my introduction to Marsha Bannister and Jesse Anderson in Corinne Munder's 2014 short film, Finding the Why. And if you haven't yet seen it, um, I really encourage you to have a look at it. It's very easily accessible on YouTube and there are the details there. Um, so in one frame from the film, which I'll show you here, um, the, the, the monarch is inserted under Marsha and Jesse's names, residents and bucket list sales managers, one assistant, of course, held my attention. Uh, the conjunction of two seemingly contradictory terms did not perturb me, but rather served to point the way to an exploration of these care practices through a rarely used lens in age studies, that of theatre and performance. So as a theatre and performance studies scholar, I know that performance understands doubleness. I, to um, explicate this, I jump to Richard Schechner, who's supposedly the father of performance studies, which is kind of the uber field under which theatre sort of sits or slots into. He argues that in performance, ordinary people and objects can be transformed as they simultaneously not themselves, as they are simultaneously not themselves and not not themselves, allowing multiple selves to exist in an unresolved dialectical tension. His notion of performance consciousness is also of, of, of value here. Sorry, I think I've got it there. Uh, here's the performance consciousness. Performance consciousness um, is useful too. It activates alternatives. This and that are both operative simultaneously. It is subjunctive, he says, full of alternatives and potentiality. Um, uh, he also argues that um, performers and sometimes spectators too are changed by the activity of performing. 
Um, he also contends that anything can be studied as performance. So we think of it often just as theatre, as art theatre, but he says anything can be studied as performance. So performance questions can be asked of whatever is being studied, location, appearance, clothes worn, objects in use, the roles people play and how these change over time. Now, it is also my understanding that theatre brings into existence things that might not otherwise have been thought of. In this instance, that Marsha and Jesse could be managers, allowing spectators to deliberate on what could be different to the present situation. Narrative resistance and narrative reconfiguration figure here as well. So building on these ideas, if we accept the idea from um, states, but states that we are all, in a manner of speaking, performers, then it follows that we are all also spectators to the performances of others in our lives. So in my view, this dyadic partnership has an ethical dimension, which is actuated through intersubjective embodied communicative encounters. These encounters may also be deemed creative when the performers in them, and in this instance, in my chapter, it's the residents at Starrett Lodge in New South Wales, are encouraged or allowed to adopt roles taken from theatre that move beyond the sometimes restrictive roles allocated to them by the spectators in their lives. That's us, families, carers and other residents due to their age or illness. If these encounters continue over time and are based on mutual respect, then I argue that an ethics of care is likely set in motion. So in a nutshell, my contribution to the volume in this chapter is to harness performance tools and broader understandings of narrative to reframe two particular care practices, the bucket list and the calendar projects, as narrow theatrical, rather than just seeing them as responsibility for tasks that might not normally be expected of older people in a care home. By partaking in these practices and seeing them this way, residents are enabled to step out of their expected roles into new ones, and in the process, constricting narratives which connect them only to their past identities, so common particularly with older people in homes, or paradoxically which see them as powerless to live into those past identities if they so choose, might be changed. So viewing these care practices as I do in the chapter through the tools of theatre, the lens of performance and an expansive understanding of narrative. I think that older people living in care facilities can be seen as productive contributors rather than just as recipients of care, takers or burdens. So finally, to close to finishing up, the role plays and narrative improvisations of the bucket list and the calendar projects open possibilities for many of the residents to live in new and dynamic ways and to be appreciated by the spectators of these performances of possibilities. Seeing themselves as bucket list managers allowed Marsha and Jesse to grow in confidence such that their agency in the home increased. They started to think about other ways in which they could express themselves and whether or not they needed permission to do so, as is evidenced by the fact that they instigated the first Calendar Girls project without seeking permission from management which shows the changes wrought by narrow theatrical practices on building agency and changing roles in a care home. And I'll just finish with a picture of the two, um, semi-naked. <laughs> they were actually only bared to their shoulders. Um, clad for the 2017 Calendar Girls Project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much indeed, Janet. And we're so grateful for the, <laughs> that you uh, you stayed up and joined us. You know, we can't thank you enough for doing that. And yeah, just just another exemplary um, introduction to to this exciting work. I'm really, really thrilled to have you. So thank you. Um, and um, really pleased also to welcome Amir Cohen Shalev um, from affiliated to the University of. Tel Aviv, um, among other um, connections, and yeah, in in Israel, and we're yeah really really pleased to have you with us, um, and to talk to us about the evolution of care uh, in and I'm going to say this wrong. I think it was Sylvan B. Gillison's the last <laughs> of the Twilight of a Light. Yeah, sorry, you can correct me, but um, yeah, please. Thank go you. Ahead. Thank you. Um, okay. I uh, was well, speaking to you from Tel Aviv. Uh, this chapter offers a, a double bill. Two documentary films, one is called The Last Postcard, the other Twilight of Life, made seven years apart by the same filmmaker, whose name is Sylvain Bigelizen, um, who is an Israeli born in, in Belgium, in Antwerp, in Belgium. Uh, both focus on his relationship with his mother at two different points in her and accordingly in his life. Um, uh, his name 
his mother's name is Diane. Um, she had lost the first beloved husband in the Holocaust. She survived, was reunited with the two sons, returned to Antwerp, remarried, and had a third son, this Sylvain, born in 1948. Then he moved at 18, he moved to Israel and has been living here since, since but keeping contact with his family in, in Antwerp. Um, when he was about 60, in 2009, um, he gets his mother consent to make a film of reparation, setting a very complicated mother-child relationship uh, straight before it's too late. Uh, the first of the last postcard digs into this lifelong troubled relationship when the mother, Diane, is 87, physically capable, perfectly lucid. Seven years later, Sylvan comes back to her to be with her when the now 94-year-old Diane is completely bedridden and occasionally confused. Watching these films one after the other offers a unique opportunity to examine developmental changes in, in, in practices of care. The first one, the last postcard, is the story of an adult son deeply frustrated by a dominant, tough, even domineering mother, demanding acknowledgement and unresolved conflicts and seeking reconciliation. He comes to receive care from a parental authority. This underlying hierarchy evolves in the later film into a dialogue between equals, acknowledging vulnerability and reciprocity. It is a movement within the parent-child dyad from a confrontation reconciliation discourse to a caring platform of mutuality and collaboration. Having established a resonant report with uh, the person his mother has come to be, most of the second film, Twilight of a Life, is devoted to Sylvan experimenting with altered caring repertoire. Such care is attuned to his mother's momentary experience. Most memorably significant for the issue of care are the mutual excursions into uh, the realm of the senses. The complete return to central feeling is manifested by the mother's expressed joy in taste, touch, sound, and movement, re restricted as it is. She says, caressing is a language, it is everything, converting language into almost abstract, pure sensuality, as in a close-up, her hand caresses slash talks with, his, uh, uh, with her son's hand uh, in a synchronized dance of minor movements. Moving from touch to sound, Sylvain sings songs of Jacques Brel, not so much it seems to improve memory or promote continuity of self in the end, but for the sheer pleasure of the intimacy these sounds foster. In one scene, he sings to his mother a song he wrote especially for her, characterized by tonal simplicity and repetition, where her joy in mouthing the refrain is evident. It is music as intimate communication more than a deliberately therapeutic tool. The end provides a singular illustration of the actual twilight, blending the light of lucidity and the darkness of disorientation in the way in a way that evokes the many types and stages of old age dementia. Lying in her bedroom, in her house, she asks Sylvan, there is here a bedroom where I'm sleeping. I don't know where they put me. Where am I exactly? And Sylvan, the son, with a plate of food in his hand, reassures her that this is indeed her home, to which she replies, bon appetit, pause. Since you say you're in my home, I'm saying bon appetit. This is one of many examples illustrating how Diane reflects on her own lack of orientation and recalling conventional etiquette of interpersonal behavior while acknowledging her fractional awareness. With the son as partner, such played out patterns of interaction also become signals of introspection. For example, when she says, you always want to stay at home, you have a hand that warms you, but where is my home? These moments hinge on and are realized through partnership. As the end sums it up, you are the one that gives me strength. When we are two, we have so much strength. My reading highlights the old age, sorry, old age and dementia as an expression of otherwise personhood, a state of foregone hierarchies, social as well as interpersonal, and the egalitarian sense-centeredness that potentially emerges instead. When a very old representative through, through the biopolitical lens of bed and body work, this leaves little or no room for, dialog for dialog dialogical exchange. This is where the last postcard in Twilight for Life offers something new. Instead of apparent re uh, rationality of consent, autonomy, agency, and rights, like in the last postcard, 
twilight of the life shifts into a contract of relational care that is contingent upon normalizing old age. When Sylvan asks the end how old people should be treated by others, she replies in a single word, normal. Such normality expresses itself in simple things of the present, joint activities, singing, touching, affectionate responsiveness, and humor, open, wide laughter, and self-irony, like when she says, I'm not old enough to know. Uh, interaction no longer informed by past or future conflicts and anachronistic hierarchies becomes a transgenerational experience of bare humanness, made up with the work of here and now in its concrete and sensuous antiques, touch, smell, taste, movement, and sound. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, and sounding like absolutely fantastic work. Um, so now I want to introduce um, Raquel Medina, who needs no introduction to many of you, or all of you probably. Um, who, um, so Raquel from University of Aston, but I think joining us probably from Spain today. Yes, from Barcelona. Right. Yeah. We're very, very grateful to you all for coming from, from such diverse places to, to be here. Um, it's great to see you and uh, I'm delighted to introduce your or introduce you, introducing your chapter, uh, Dementia in Familial Documentary Film, The Ethics of Representation and the Ethics of Care. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. I'm going to just for the sake of having some images while I read my presentation. Uh, let me, I hope it works. Does it work? Yes? Great. Um, so yes, um, what I do in my chapter, first of all, thanks, thanks to, to Katsura and, and, uh, and to Sarah for putting together this wonderful volume and to allow me to be in such a wonderful uh, company as well. So my chapter examines two documentary films, The Mexican Tiempo Suspendido, Time Suspending, 2015, by Natalia Bruchstein, and the Spanish El Señor Liberti, Los Pequeños Placeres, Mr. Liberto and the Small Pleasures, 2018, by Anna Serrez. In Bruchstein's film, the filmmaker interviews her grandmother, Laura Bonaparte, who lives with dementia and is well known as one of the co-founders of the movement Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, Mothers of the May uh, Square in Argentina. In Serret's film, the filmmaker records the daily life of her father, Liberto Serret, uh, a retired civil engineer and inventor who has Alzheimer's disease and lives with his daughter, son-in-law and grandchildren. Documentaries about and with people living with dementia, such as these two uh, films, are powerful tools to, that raise important issues such as the ethics of representation, vulnerability, and care. Hence, how these tools are employed to tell the story of vulnerable subjects has a crucial ethical dimension that affects not only the person with dementia and the viewer, but also the way caring for a person with dementia is represented and provided. Despite the fact that both films are characterized by a familial, familial relationship between the film directors and the main protagonist, the comparison between these two documentary films shows two different, almost anti, uh, antithetical uh, ways of presenting people with dementia in front of the camera. The comparative analysis underlines that the harm to subjects that the, film, the filmic interaction can cause can be mitigated by the role assigned to the person living with dementia in front of the camera and the concept of care presented. Tiempo Suspendido, Suspendido focuses on the dual nature of Laura Bonaparte as a private uh, citizen and as a public figure, and by doing so, it patently emphasizes the role of the public figure and relegates the private one to the otherness that aging and dementia entail. Um, in contrast, uh, El Señor Liberto shows that Liberto's identity has remained intact by focusing on his subjectivity and his lived experience instead of the deficits. These opposite approaches to the object subject of knowledge have an, an overarching effect in terms of the ethics of representation and the ethics of care. Each film presents a different concept of care ethics. 
while tiempo suspendido focuses on the paradoxical quality of memory and its meaning within the political context of Argentina, El Señor Liberto documents embodied memory and how the individual is part of different networks of relationships that define both them and their com counterparts. Regardless of memory loss, Serret's film tells us that memory of the senses is what we all share and therefore we can communicate through them when language is gone. By showing on screen how a person living with dementia is cared for, both films foreground kick aspects of the experiences of dementia and care. For instance, in Tiempo Suspensido, Laura's physical and mental deterioration becomes, uh, becomes central, and it is a stress as the film progresses by increasingly introducing uh, scenes where her daily routine at the nursing home is shown. In Sarad's film, three generations of the same family live together, and although they hire a caregiver to carry out a daily care for Liberto, they all participate in the same activities and daily routines that incorporate the person living with dementia. It could be said that Liberto is placed at the same level as any other family member, therefore receiving care and being cared about. Finally, the role that the camera plays and where it positions the viewer are essential for the ultimate understanding of the meaning of dementia at both individual and social levels, and consequently can have a crucial part in shaping the social understanding uh, of what living with dementia involves. Tiempo Suspendido maintains the distance between the cinematographic object, those on film, and the viewers who witness the harmon moment in which um, well, the, maybe, the karma moment in which Bonaparte is pushed to remember the death of her children. Despite the possibility of initially generating a very brief and momentarily empathic uh, response, the objective gaze does not allow any further affective engagement with the person living with dementia beyond pity. From this point onwards, the viewers gazing at Bonaparte are likely to experience emotions of fear and feelings of disgust as a consequence of the film's emphasis on Bonaparte's decline. In contrast, El Señor Liberto deploys a cinematic language based on haptic visuality or visuality of the senses. Through this haptic the subject the, 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 the subjective camera allows the viewer to experience what Liberto feels, thus facilitating understanding and communication. This communication leads to a practice of care that could be considered reciprocal and interpersonal and goes beyond the filming object per se, because the viewer becomes a participant in the network of relationships of which Robert, Liberto is part. In this film, Serret employs an original cinematic language to emphatically connect with the person living with dementia through emotions and effects and to present embodied memories that are shared and lived with the viewer. This way, the notion that one affects others, one is affected by others, and we feel with others becomes in this film the pillar of its ethics of care. Thank you so very much. Um, again, just yeah, beautiful work. Um, so I'm uh, going to steal a, a couple of minutes now to say just a, um, a little bit about my own essay in the volume. So I hope that's not too cheeky. Um, uh, probably not even four minutes, but just a, a few thoughts about uh, about that chapter. Um, so. Um, I'm writing um, about uh, aging um, in the North American short story um, in my chapter um, and thinking about the, chrono the idea of the chronotope, so how space and time um, relate to one another um, and are sort of brought into relationship with each other through, through symbols, through through settings um, in the stories, um, but also how the genre of the short story um, encourages us to think about, um, about space and time um, and particularly aging in relation to those things. Um, so 
and, and I'm looking specifically at Margaret Atwood's uh, story, Torching the Dusties, um, which has, has had a number of sort of um, well-known explorations in age studies, as, as you know. Um, I'm looking at um, Joy Williams's short story, Stuff, um, about a, um, a sort of middle-aged son visiting his older mother in uh, a care home uh, after a diagnosis of, of um, on his part of a terminal um, condition. Um, so, and, and his processing of that. Um, and um, John Barth's story, Peeping Tom, um, about a, a retirement community in America and a, and a voyeur who, who uh, comes um, into the picture. Um, Torching the Dusties, if you don't know, it is the story of um, a, a kind of a care home besieged by uh, the younger generation, resentful of um, the, the kind of economic burden, um, as it's perceived that, that the older people in this kind of very um, affluent sort of lavish um, institution represents so the, the they're literally at the gates um and there's a kind of escape um jailbreak kind um, style narrative involving two of the residents of that story um i'm sort of thinking about them in the, the frame of um or through a frame which which thinks about uh, finitude and a sort of apprehension uh, perhaps of shortened horizons that uh, that sort of advanced older age might bring, um, and and how this might find a kind of um, a, a fit with the form of a short story, um, which which sort of um, generally has perhaps the affinity for around affinity for the sense of an ending um, in its in its form. I think short stories that sort of seem to be able to capture this kind of this sense of, of perhaps a foreshortened time or even a foreshortened life. Um, and I think um, short story, these short stories bring together and, and find a form for uh, aging. Um, and bring that together with a general sense of a kind of, of dystopia or even apocalypse um, and, and perhaps sort of think about, reflect in a sense in there, in doing so on the way in which ageing is, is sometimes used as a kind of symbol um, of, of a more general kind of wider apocalypse or a kind of looming disaster, so looming economic disaster or ecological collapse. Um, in the case of these stories. Um, but all this, I think, sound is perhaps sounding to you a little bit ageist in itself. <laughs> um, you know, these, these connections that, that the culture might make between ageing and crisis <laughs> or collapse. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm sort of arguing that these stories hold um, ageing and apocalypse in a kind of ironic relation. Um, and while the spaces of aging can appear dystopian, um, the, the, the way in which age is siloed in certain spaces in society can, um, can sort of um, lend itself to dystopian tales. Um, and the time of older age can seem apocalyptic. I think here the older people are more resilient than the young in these stories. They're dealing with the general condition of societal um, or the threat of societal collapse in a more, uh, perhaps in a in a more resilient way than the younger generations. You know, they're more able to forge connections in the face of these of these um, difficulties and find solutions. Um, and they kind of overcome the constraints of these of their social segregation and and the kind of confinement, um, perhaps that they that they live in um, in these sort of managed spaces um, and and foster intimacy um, that that kind of um, is in tension with the the the, the genre or the or the sort of um, dystopian mood that the stories initially appear to present. Um, so. I think I think um, I'm using Ron and Bart's idea of chronotope to, which brings together, as I said, space and time, um, both in terms of genre and in terms of the thematics of this of these stories, and showing how they tell very different 
um, they, or they challenged the, the the narratives of old days that we might be familiar with, and they and they use their own kind of form in in quite a, a clever and ironic way um, in representing age. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so finally. Um, I'm really, really pleased to, to move on from that and uh, to introduce Simon Buck, um, who has joined us, I know, after um, a busy day, but we're really, really pleased to have him with us um, and to hear about something about another media, a medium, um, and the medium of music. Um, he's based um, in in uh, Newcastle, and I don't know uh, if he's joining us from there or not. But um, but thank you very much for joining us, and um, we're we're really pleased to hear from you about um, go uh, or for, about a chapter called "Ghosts on the Canvas: Glenn Campbell's Musical Narratives of Aging, Alzheimer's Disease, and Care." Thanks. Um, yes, I am joining from Newcastle. Um, and I have just ran back from work. So thanks very much for squeezing me on the end of the schedule. I'll try to make it relatively brief if I can. Um, so my chapter comes sort of rolls out of some work that I do on old age and aging in music in the Southern United States. But primarily my focus is really the early 20th century, so sort of nearer the, the, the incoming of Social Security. But being a fan of, of the country and pop singer Glenn Campbell, um, I felt like it was an appropriate topic to um, go forward with this collection. Um, if people aren't familiar with Glenn Campbell, he started out in the 60s as a sort of crossover country pop musician. And he had that typical blonde, blue eyed, kind of beautiful hunk of a guy that you'd see on the poster of um, teenagers' uh, walls. And in this, in this chapter, I'll talk about a couple of different things. First of all, I situate Glenn Campbell's kind of aging narratives that he talks about and sings about later in his life from his earlier career and when he was a younger singer and part of the country music tradition of, of reverence for elders and then the complex dynamics of having that reverence for elders during the kind of 60s youth explosion of the 1960s. So in a way, there's a kind of life course approach to what I'm doing with this, like seeing aging, not just in somebody's old age, but also how they felt about these ideas when they were younger, how they treated them. Um, so um, when he was later um, in his older age, um, he had a series of symptoms of, of what seemed like dementia and then finally a diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease uh, around 2010. Um, and at that point, he takes an interesting move, an interesting decision, him and his team, to rather than like other famous musicians, um, decides to make a, a documentary of him going on what's described as a farewell tour, but goes on for quite, quite a few years. And also to make what I describe as these kind of dementia themed concept albums, um, which is a kind of a new field in popular music from what I can gather um, there has been people singing about dementia um, before. There's been songs about dementia representations, but not necessarily by the artist themselves. So this is something I think the music can can offer us. Um, if, if you read the piece, you'll see there's a it's a mixed bag of of those kind of representations, those narratives of aging and dementia in his songs. Sometimes it's very basic stuff to do with decline that I'm sure we're all kind of familiar with. Sometimes there's more complex stuff to do with memory and particular, the thing I'm most interested in being a music scholar is the ways that, that sound is used on those records. And you do have to really listen deeply to it to pick them apart, but you can find them. So as well as, as, well as there being some criticisms to be made of these often simplistic depictions of, of sonic aging and sonic illness in older age, I think there's some opportunities there for the future. And I think this is a field that will grow um, in future years following Campbell's work. Um, so overall with the piece, I think there's a, there's a couple of other things I'd just like to mention, which is, is how in popular music, there is a kind of tension when thinking about artists with <clears throat> cognitive impairment, um, because on the one hand, you can be a legend. And there is a big field in popular music for being the elderly, older lit legend, who does the hits and does the tours and Glenn Campbell was kind of already living that life and how cognitive impairment, at least the way it's presented by the industry kind of cuts through that um, typical trajectory of, of, of the older artists of the late style in popular music. Um, and it becomes very interesting when they start to then narrate those 
ideas within within the music itself. So I think Glen Campbell is a good opportunity for us to understand that a bit more. Um, and the last thing is is to do with is to do with care. So um, Glen Campbell's um, second wife was his primary carer, um, as well as you know he was he was very wealthy, so he did have a lot of private um, health care at the same time. Um, something I he does talk about his wife and and feelings of guilt um, and feelings of loss um, about that relationship to do with his memory loss, um, which are not unproblematic but are definitely interesting in themselves. But there's also an, an, another element of this to do with music specifically, which is, you know, there's a, obviously a lot of discussion in, in the field of music therapy of music as a form of, of care. And this, I think the Glenn Campbell example is another example of something that's been mentioned in some of these other presentations about how narrative can be a, a form of care in itself, um, even if it's not always um, uh, perfectly ethical in some ways. Um, and I feel sometimes with his music, you can you can really feel and hear that, um, particularly when he plays with his children, who also provided you know elements of care, practical care, as well as emotional care, while touring and recording with him. Um, so that's pretty much it. The, the last thing I'd say is that, and this is something I don't really talk about at all in in, in the article, but as a sort of meta layer of this in, in my own personal life, that. As I was doing this, you know, COVID hit and I was editing and, and I was obviously listening to a hell of a lot of Glenn Campbell, the good and the bad and definitely the ugly. And there's some real ugly Glenn Campbell out there if you really want to dig into it. Um, but I do feel that it was very interesting during those harder parts of lockdown when my my elderly mother was um, isolating with you know she has chronic health conditions and so she was really one of these people that was very scared and remains very scared in the pandemic world that we live in and sharing Glenn Campbell's music with her, um, you know, I couldn't be there to physically care for her in ways that perhaps I normally would do. Um, and I feel like having this communication about music and just saying, oh, I found this pretty groovy Glenn Campbell track from 1971, have you heard it before? That kind of communication, it may not be the traditional form of care, but for me it was, caring for her and I think it was also caring for me um, in a way so music can have that power in, in in a way that is you know effective and all of these beautiful things that we like about the arts so uh, yeah that's me thank you very much thank you so much for, for that Simon um, just just really rich reflections you know some about the chapter and, and beyond um, and and thank you to everyone thank you to all our contributors for such a rich and um you know extraordinary picture of the the contents of um of the volume um and you know it's it's just great to have you with us today um and we haven't unfortunately heard from Mao Hu Deng who also has um uh, an essay on cinema um and Hong Kong cinema in the volume um and also um Sally Chivers, who names many of you uh, writing about Helen Garner, Helen Garner's The Spare Room. And of course, there's a chapter by Katsura and Sarah um, themselves um, on um, ch the children's picture books in Japan and, and the, the kind of idea of care and reciprocity. Um, reciprocity, I think, has kind of cut across all, you know, many of the contributions into subjectivity, um, thinking about the ethics of care and, and these, you know, the, the different media, thinking through kind of care and aging through these different media, allowing us to kind of um, think about sort of the different senses, even sort of sound and touch and gaze in a really, really kind of rich way, you know, these, the visual and the, the sensory and, and the aural kind of angles as well as the literary I think be just giving us a really um, rich picture of, of kind of ideas of intersubjectivity and performance um, that, that you know bring some really great connections together um, we because of time constraints I think the, the editors have made a sort of executive decision that we we won't have a sort of I won't have a kind of um, Q&A with them um now um because i know we're we're sort of over over time but um i did sort of give promise the opportunity for for some questions if you have them i don't know if that's still okay shirley um uh, that that's absolutely fine we can you know we can sort of um extend it by by a few minutes 
Sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to go in a minute. So I'm just going to leap in and take the opportunity to say something that's really part of the final discussion, but it relates equally to the, the book. Um, two things, first of all, um, obviously, thank you very much indeed for this conference. I, um, I've enjoyed it very much. And I think it's a tribute to the, uh, the relevance and the, 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 uh, the importance of what's been discussed today that so many of us have used the word moving in questions. And I have found many of the sessions very moving. I, I love academic work that actually has uh, immediate relevance to um, Sorry, my phone, oh, the phone's going now. Uh, immediate relevance to live, the way that we live, to our lives, and, and has a, you know, a slightly transformative effect. Um, but the point that I wanted to make, which I was very conscious of from the first two papers this morning, but in a way it's kept recurring throughout the day, is the, um, the political resonance of literary, cultural, artistic representations of ageing. Because the model of selfhood that has been in different ways described, the, the model of selfhood that comes through effective caring, both for the carer and for the person being cared for, particularly in a lot of the papers, it's been to do with somebody aging. That model of selfhood, which is um, you know, not coherent, not goal-driven, collaborative rather than highly independent, is the absolute reverse of what is considered a viable model of selfhood in a neoliberal culture. It, it's, it's just not something that a neoliberal culture can deal with. It denies everything that uh, all the principles of profit and efficiency and effectiveness. And I think COVID has intensified for a lot of people, the recognition of the gap between that model of selfhood to which we are constantly being invited and solicited and encouraged and the model of selfhood, which is very, very different that, that some of us have been found ourselves living in a very everyday, tangible manner um, under COVID. And I thought that was really a very strong recurring theme, theme through the day. And it's an important one. And it's part of the reason why the papers have been moving and are actually about, you know, what we're, what we're living. <laughs> that, that, that was it. It's not a question. It was just an observation. I think it's wonderful to get observation style at this at, at, at this point. You know that are drawing drawing out some of the really key um, you know core areas that we've all been developing throughout the day. So thank you so much for that. It was just incredibly well put. Um, I think the last thing is we can share this. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. And yeah. Um, I, I think that's really yeah I mean I'm certainly I've been moved by what I've heard you know in just in this in this last last session as well um and there's a there's a comment in the chat from Bridie saying I don't know if you want to to read it but um, about the ref the the reference to parents as models for care I don't know if you want to say anything more about that Bridie yes obviously that's there in my chapter <clears throat> but I was struck by how how often it comes up that both carers and cared for seem to be the sub parents seem to be the 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 models for that you know so um mm -hmm. uh, that's how how relevant it is diana's opening statement there that it's um it's something that's very moving very relevant to now very immediate to us all i assume and uh you know and and thinking about how we would like to be cared for when we become in that position of needing care i think we all feed off our own the models that our parents have given us um and it certainly is there in my chapter the the, the recognition that um there's a sort of as i was trying to say a circuit of care that comes into being or comes more into focus when we are caring for our parents it becomes apparent that we are in this sort of chronological circuit of care that relates back to our own understanding of care that we received. So yeah, something around that is really seems to be relevant to the, today. Can, can I just leap in and ask, because I'm really aware that, that, um, that Kasura and Sarah haven't had a chance to, to come in and say, you know, we're, we're, we're here in this part of the event because of the brilliant book that we were all privileged enough to, to be invited to contribute to. Um, so I really think that as editors of that, it'd be, it'd be nice if we did hear something from you. Um, 
Sarah? Oh, thank you, Bridie. <laughs> yeah, Bridie has the big. It is available open access. I'll just, just remind <laughs> everyone of that. Um, thanks to some, some funding from Japan. Um, I think all, all that Katia and I probably would want to say, apart from thank you to all of our contributors for their very constructive and, and really helpful and very determined um, work on their chapters in the face of everything that was going on as we edited this book. And there was so much going on as we edited this book. And we are really grateful that we all got to the end um, and, that, and that we managed to produce it. Um, but I think I think um, the whole, uh, the yoking of narrative and care was really, really important for us and the thinking about narrative's care. And it goes back, I think, a little bit something, I think it was Di maybe said, around the importance of, uh, and Simon certainly, the importance of, of texts, of narratives of all kinds, both in um, both in the way that we understand what it is to age across the life course and what it is to care, um, but also that, that they may in themselves be caring practices, not only for the people that produce them, but for us as readers and viewers. Um, and, that, and, and Raquel was talking about this too, that, that they, may, they may enact practices of care through their consumption, through the relationality and the mutuality that they inspire. And I think that that came out more and more as we edited this book and as we saw the overlaps in the chapters. So... Um, it's great that, that that's been obviously the subject of the, of the conference as well. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Katsuri, did you want to say and anything? I, yes, I just wanted to say thank you. And um, having this project was really, really good for me as well, because um, during the lockdown, this really sort of helped me to keep going, um, getting on my, uh, with my work. And having that sort of communication with the contributors really helped, um, especially because I'm based in in Japan. So there's this sort of geographical distance as well. And then also, I think uh, I just want to say about this uh, uh, caring for parents. And I think this is uh, one of the very interesting fields where you feel the impact of your academic work on your personal life. Um, I certainly felt like um, starting to care for my uh, father who's been ill, I felt um, quite grateful that I've been reading about care ethics, for example. <laughs> and like every time I have been interactions, I kind of reflect on my um, actions and then behaviors and then sort of checking on my um, sort of evaluating my own care practice in that sense. So I think um, it's a really good, great field to be working on, I think, at the, at the moment. So um, thank you very much for everyone today. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Katsura. Um, I, 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 I just second that from my point of view be, be, before we draw to a close, because I think we are going to have to draw to a close yeah. because I'm sorry I've got a train to catch and we've gone over time a, a little bit already. Um, but I was just going to say for, for me, um, you know, I, I'm at a time in my career where this, is, this will be my last research move. This is the last thing that I'm working on and I've never been so convinced not that, I mean, not that I'm going to contribute to anything amazing, but I've never been so convinced that it's a really, really vital area to, to be working in. And that connection with my lived experience and the lived experience of so many people and a sense of the timeliness of what we're collectively looking at, uh, I think to me is um, it, it gets me out of bed in the morning. So um, I, I'm just going to thank everybody who's still with us <laughs> um, so much for your, uh, your contributions today. Um, Emily, thank you so much for, for, for working on this conference and, and, and making it happen with me. I don't know if you want to say anything before we close. No? Okay. Um, so I, I think it's a case of watch this, watch this space. There'll be so much more, um, so many more of these kinds of, uh, kinds, of, kinds of gatherings where we can get together and share our thoughts on new texts and, and performances and so on that, that have come out. And I, I really look forward to them. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. <laughs>